But thanks to everybody for joining us for, uh, today for this timely presentation on Indian Point's baffling reactor vessel bolts, the implications for nuclear safety and the reactors. My name is Tim Judson, Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, which is hosting the webinar. Uh, we're pleased to be joined today by David Lockbaum, the Nuclear Safety Engineer for the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, who will walk us through the of this problem that's been discovered at the Indian Point Unit 2 reactor. Uh, as a bit of background leading into this, uh, we feel that we felt years felt it was important uh, to hold this webinar now to give uh, both people in New York and elsewhere around the country uh, some some information and perspective about the nature of the problem that's been discovered at Indian Point Two and what its implications may be for nuclear safety across the country. Uh, NIRS has been a uh, NIRS is a national environmental organization that watchdogs the nuclear industry, um, and we've been active in efforts closed the Indian Point nuclear power plant for several years. Um, the, the event that occurred, or the incident that, that, that occurred in March, uh, was during a refueling outage at Indian Point Unit 2, uh, in which uh, the owner of the plant, Entergy, had been required to conduct an inspection of the reactor internals. And among those components that were inspected uh, were the bolts that hold uh, the, um, several of the internal components together including the reactor pressure vessel baffle, uh, which, as Dave Lockbaum will explain, is, is an essential, is an essential part of the, 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 the cooling system for the reactor. Um, this has occurred you know, in a broader context of uh, concerns about Indian Point, which have, uh, which have been playing out through uh, the, the federal uh, relicensing review for the reactor uh, to extend its operation for an extra 20 years. Um, as well as a series of, uh, of other maintenance-related safety issues and equipment failures uh, at the plant, uh, both Indian Point 2 and its uh, sister reactor, Indian Point 3, over the last year. Uh, and so there's been a, a great deal of attention paid to this, to this development within New York uh, because of the implications that it has for the continued operation of this nuclear power plant. But, it, but we believe it has broader implications for the rest of the nuclear industry uh, because of its connection to the uh, to, to the aging of the reactor fleet, and so we felt it was very important to be able to uh, to bring some technical expertise to this discussion uh, and to give some perspective for others who haven't uh, had the benefit of, of all of the attention this is getting in New York right now. Um, so with that, I, I would like to uh, to hand the presentation over to David Lockbaum, um, who has uh, been with UCS for over 20 years and has. Of experience um, having uh, also worked within the industry um, and is one of our foremost nuclear safety experts in the country. Um, so if you'll just hold on a second, I'll we'll hand over the controls of the presentation to David, uh, then uh, he'll begin in just a second. So thank you, Dave, for joining us and for doing this presentation. Thank you for uh, hosting this webinar series of the great benefit to me and also appreciate the opportunity to share our perspectives on this issue with the audience. Um, not seeing the uh, big screen yet. Uh, I think as long as you operate your screen, uh, your, your computer normally, David, it should, it, should, uh, it should bring up your presentation. If not, we can switch it back to mine and I have your slides queued up. Okay. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not seeing the. Uh, are, are you seeing the nearest web, my, my screen right now? Uh, I was just a second ago. It seems to have faded out. Um, okay. I'll, we'll, we'll we'll switch to uh, to um, to your slides that are queued up on on my screen. Okay. Next slide, please. Great. It was last month that uh, workers at Indian Point, uh, the new Indian Point Nuclear Plant in New York, reported to the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board and other parties involved in the license renewal proceeding that they had identified degradation in about 10 percent of the core baffle former bolts on the Unit 2 pressurized water reactor. Indian Point 3 has not yet been inspected. These core baffle bolts were installed at all U.S. pressurized water reactors, which comprise about two-thirds of the U.S. fleet of nuclear reactors. The other third, boiling water reactors, use metal hemispheres that are welded together rather than bolted together, 
and that device or that part is called the core shroud, which is head cracking of its own, as, as Tim and others uh, will remember from Nine Mile Point. Next slide, please. Just from some background on what, where these parts are, they're inside the reactor vessel over on the left-hand side of the screen within that uh, spotlight. The reactor vessel core sits inside the reactor vessel, which in turn is housed within the containment, the dome-shaped concrete vessel, with buildings on either side, the auxiliary building on one side and some of the waste processing building on the other side. Next slide, please. This looks a little closer at the reactor vessel part of the overall scheme. The baffle plate and the former plate are shown in purple. Uh, the, they're just inside, a, in this figure, a greenish looking thing called the core barrel, which surrounds the, the, core, the baffle plate and the former plate. The reactor core, the, the fuel assemblies, sit on the inside of the baffle former assembly. Next slide, please. This is a say, cutout view showing the baffle and former plates in the center as they reside in the reactor core on the left, and a close-up of some of the parts on the extreme right. The core former and core baffle are essentially a, allow the, the round reactor core to sit inside a square hole. It the when, when they're all bolted together, the, the former plates and the baffle plates completely surround the sides of the reactor core. The top and the bottom of this assembly is open to allow water to flow through upward through the reactor core. Next slide, please. This is a close-up showing the baffle, the bolts that hold the baffle plates to the former plates. They're the horizontal holes or dots in this diagram, a bolt fits through those holes to, to keep the metal vertical plates, the baffles, and fit those to or fasten those to the horizontal plates or the former. Next slide. Wait, hold on this one just a second, Tim. Workers found that th there was degradation in 227 of the 832 bolts that hold these plates together. For context, of all the inspections done to date, the average pressurized water reactor has found degradation in 2% or less of these bolts. For some reason, there's a, a much more pronounced failure rate or degradation rate on Union Point Unit 2, more than 10% or more than 10 times higher than the national average thus to date. Next slide, please. To further confuse what, what can be a confusing topic, there's other bolts inside uh, that are involved that are called the baffle former edge bolts. As, it, as shown in this diagram, they're the ones that run vertically at the edges where these metal plates fit together. Uh, there's many more of those, um, but, and their failure is not quite as important as the former and baffle bolts for reasons that we'll get to in just a moment. Next slide, please. This is looking down inside at a, the baffle plates and former plates that have been bolted together. You see at the very bottom of the picture is the grid that the fuel assemblies reside in when they're loaded. This is a completely empty assembly. That's not even in the reactor core. But you can see at the very top surface the flat tops of the former plates, and you can see between them that the vertical baffle plates that extend all the way from the top to the bottom of the assembly. When the reactor fuel is loaded inside, again, the whole part, one of the primary purposes of this whole assembly is to force water to go upward through the reactor core instead of skipping it altogether. Another purpose of this assembly that was endowed later in life, it wasn't part of the original design, was that this assembly helps absorb some of the neutrons that are emitted by atoms fissioning in the reactor core. In addition, the water that fills the, these gaps absorbs some of those neutrons and helps protect the metal reactor vessel from embrittling even faster than it already does. Next slide, please. This is another look uh, down inside the 
baffle and former plates inside a reactor vessel. You see the core barrel at the very top with the two nozzles on the upper left corner. The baffle and former plates are, bolt, are bolted together and installed in this reactor vessel. And again, the, ascent, the grid that holds the fuel assemblies appears in the center, bottom center. Very common for all the pressurized water reactors used in the United States. Next slide, please. This is a table from a document prepared by the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, uh, which is a, a uh, industry group funded by the nuclear industry, the power companies themselves. EPRI, a few years ago, did a, an analysis of what, was, what kind of testing and inspections are necessary for parts inside the reactor vessel, including the bolts, baffle plates, etc. This particular table from that very large EPRI document specifically addresses how the baffle bolts inside the bolts inside the reactor vessel at any point two and any point three will be inspected. The fifth column over says that a visual examination called VT3 will be done to look for distortion with the baseline inspection or the first examination being conducted between 20 and 40 effective full power years, EFPY is the acronym, and then once that baseline inspection is done, then there's a requirement to re-inspect every 10 years, at least once every 10 years. Prior to these VT3 inspections conducted under this EPRI guidance document, owners had been required to ins visually inspect the baffle bolts once every 10 years. Um, these inspections being conducted at any point and elsewhere use ultrasonics to do a little bit more detailed examination of the bolts. The prior inspections that have been done at any point and other pressurized water reactors in the United States had only identified bad bolts on one occasion. So that visual inspection was uh, not very effective in identifying the degradation that was, was there and had been there for quite some time. The, the, actually, the state of New York, with its involvement and other interveners, involvement in the any point relicensing is the primary reason why this requirement is in place today. And as a, to reiterate that this is the first time this more intrusive or more uh, this better inspection technique was used at Indian Point. It was used at Indian Point Two during its current refueling outage. It has not yet been done on Indian Point Unit Three. It's currently scheduled to be done on Indian Point Unit 3 during its refueling outage in 2019. Next slide, please. The whole reason why the, it's important for the baffle plates, the bolts to be non-degraded, to remain intact and to do their thing, is primarily because when the baffle plates and the former plates are fastened properly, they force the water to go through the reactor core instead of bypassing or skipping it. If you look at this diagram, the inlet nozzle is on the right hand, or it's kind of in the center, to the right hand side of the reactor vessel. The water comes in, the cooling water, the makeup water comes in through these nozzles, is forced on the outside of the core barrel and the baffle and former plates into the lower dome shaped portion of the reactor vessel where the water gets turned around to then flow upward through the reactor core past the fuel assemblies to remove the heat that's being produced by fissioning atoms in the reactor core. Once the reactor is shut down, the K heat continues to be produced by the radioactive decay of byproducts from the fission reaction. So even after the reactor is shut down, it's important that water flow through the reactor core to remove that heat to prevent damage due to overheating or, worst case, a meltdown. Once the water flows upward through the reactor core, it then, in this diagram, takes a left-hand turn and goes out through the outlet nozzle. The outlet nozzle has a hole that we saw earlier through the core barrel that allows that water that's been warmed up now after passing through the reactor core to leave the vessel and go to the steam generators. If these bolts do not hold those uh, plates together, then seams can open that allows water to go through the, those openings between the, the plates and bypass going through the reactor core where it 
and depending on how big an opening bypass is created, the, the bypass flow or the, the amount of flow that's no longer cooling the reactor core could lead to some severe problems. There's an NOC regulation that says that the, the nuclear fuel needs to be able to be cooled before, during, and after an accident for obvious reasons. And if these baffle bolts are not doing their thing, then the ability to, first of all, to comply with the regulations could be impaired, but more importantly, the ability to, to contain the radioactivity that's produced in the reactor core could be lost or compromised. Next slide, please. The second safety concern, I don't have a nifty diagram for it, but the, some of the degradation has led to bolt the heads off the bolts to actually break loose, become free become what are called loose parts. The small metal parts are then carried by the water that's flowing at very, very high velocity sorry about that through the reactor core and those metal parts can bang up or impact uh, other things as the water carries it through. In 2007 a, a small metal part inside the system damaged steam generator tubes at Millstone Unit 3, a pressurized water reactor in Connecticut. They've also had problems when a boiling water reactor had metal parts from a steam dryer and the parts got several places. It damaged one of the pumps, the impeller on one of the pumps, and also some of the debris got into some of the safety relief valves or valves that needed to close in case of an accident to keep the reactor material inside containment. Uh, those metal, small metal parts got into places that shouldn't have been. And in 1982, uh, the NRC warned owners that uh, fuel rods could be damaged. Another comp consequence of those baffle plates co coming apart is as the water comes in from the side instead of down through the bottom up through the top, is that the water could cause fuel rods to bang against each other. And that's caused fuel rods to fail in the past, and it will in the future if that's allowed to happen. Next slide, please. There's a, the situation in any point two has raised a number of questions that uh, so far don't have any answers. Um, the first and most obvious question is, since the problem is so bad on Indian Point Unit 2, what about the similar bolts on Indian Point 3 right next door, which is a virtually identical reactor with about the same operating history? Uh, due to some problems in Indian Point Unit 3, it's got about two years less operating history or experience than Indian Point Unit 2. Um, we're also being told that the bolting pattern on Indian Point Unit 3 is a little bit different than the bolting pattern on Indian Point Unit 2. Um, that may be true, but I'm not sure why that difference makes Indian Point 3 less susceptible rather than more susceptible. But anyway, that's still a question to be answered. The NRC is trying to induce the owner to do that inspection sooner than 2019 when it's currently inspected or scheduled. Uh, what remains to be seen when that inspection will be done. I already kind of answered part of the second question. Is they have done inspections in the past that didn't find any problems at any point, you know, two or elsewhere except for one, one minor case. So the question is, you know, was the degradation there and not found? Or was this degradation occurring since the last inspection? Either way, there's no good answer to that question because if it was there and not found, then the inspections were useless, so you can't take much credit for it. If the degradation occurred since the last inspection and it's so bad, then that may suggest that doing the inspections every 10 years is not appropriate and doing it more often would be a better way to ma properly manage this aging mechanism. The third question is probably the most important to me is that Indian Point 2 and other pressurized water reactors have a loose part monitoring system, which is called the metal impact monitoring system in Indian Point. But there are acoustic monitors that are actually physically attached to the reactor vessel and some of the piping that are supposed to detect the noise made when metal parts hit other metal parts. But there's no indication that that system detected the degradation of the loose the bolt heads as they wandered through the, the system at Indian Point 2. So that, since that's the whole purpose of this system being installed, we have a little question about did it, did it fulfill that function or not. 
we think it's an important question, or the answer is pretty important, because if, if that system is doing its thing and is actually monitoring and detecting loose bolt heads and other metal parts, it would be a safety net to protect any point unit three until its inspection is done. If that system has no value and it, it doesn't detect loose parts the way it's supposed to, then that safety net uh, can't be relied upon at all. Therefore, we mentioned that some of the uh, bolt heads have broken off or can't be found so far on any point unit two. So the question is, are, you, is, are the workers going to find all those loose parts? Um, if they don't find them all, and the metal impact monitoring system can't find it once the plant restarts, what safety analysis shows that it's safe to continue operating in with these parts in places they're not supposed to be? That's kind of the fifth question. If, if you can't are unable to recover all the loose parts, the missing pieces, uh, what, what assurance is there that these loose parts won't cause further harm? The parts are small enough they could uh, get in the pathway of control rods that need to insert into the reactor core to stop the nuclear chain reaction. Could these loose parts impede that progress of one or more control rods? Several valves are open when the reactor is operating but need to close during an accident to prevent a loss of cooling water inventory and also to prevent radiation from getting outside containment. Could these loose parts block the travel of those valves and keep them from fully closing? And as loose parts have done in the past, they've damaged fuel rods and steam generator tubes. Could the loose parts, if they're not recovered, cause similar problems on any point two in the future? Uh, and what's if so, what's the, what's the protection, what's the safety net that would protect workers and the public from those bad outcomes? Um, the NRC has indicated that they won't allow any point you know, to, to restart until the problems have been addressed. We hope somewhere through the, the NRC's efforts that the answers to these five questions are, are found and reported publicly so everybody agrees that those are the right answers. Uh, I guess the next, next is that the last slide, Tim? Oops, yeah, I think it was. With that, I'd be glad to uh, answer any questions or clarify any of the information provided. Uh, if there's a mechanism for uh, posting or posing questions. Yes, thank, thank you, Dave, for that, that wonderfully clear presentation. And um, we will open it up right now. I'd like to give some instruction as to that. Um, so just a couple of notes on the process. Um, so everyone has been muted so far. Um, but um, we have a couple of options for how to ask a question. You can raise your hand by, using the, by pressing the hand icon uh, on the webinar control panel that should be on the right-hand part of your screen. And we will call people, call on people to ask their questions, uh, unmute you and ask your question, uh, you know, in turn. Uh, you can also submit a written question at any time uh, using the question panel that should also be in the in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. And we will uh, start to intersperse written questions with spoken questions, um, but we may combine the questions if they're on the same topics. Um, so with that, um, you know, while everyone is kind of queuing up with their questions. Uh, maybe I'll just sort of, uh, you know, ask an introductory one to start the discussion. Uh, so, David, um, you know, you touched on this a bit in your presentation, um, but, you know, I think the natural question that people across the country are going to have is, um, you know, what are the sort of more, you know, generic implications of, of the discovery of this issue at Indian Point uh, for other reactors either of, of similar types or all types across the country? That's a good question. I think the a lot of that remains to be seen. Um, some plants had already done this inspection, and as I mentioned, the average plant had less than 2% of the bolts found to be degraded. Union Point Unit 2 had a much higher percentage of their bolts found to be degraded. So I think there's still some uncertainty about what's causing this problem and why it's so pronounced at Union Point Unit 2. It could be, at the end of the day, it's not more pronounced. As the other plants do these inspections and find a degradate, find the, the situation of the bolts at their plants, it could be that any point two is 
uh, not more pronounced. Maybe there's somebody out there that's even worse than that. Uh, I think until the NRC and the industry better understand what's causing this problem and better define the factors that cause you to be susceptible or less susceptible to it, uh, we're, we're still in a holding pattern to see whether this is the tip of the iceberg or uh, is there's a much bigger problem out there. Uh, if you look back about 15 years ago, in 2001, workers at Oconee, a, new, a pressurized water reactor in South Carolina, found a problem with degradation. The NRC did a real good job in that situation of figuring out which of the other 68 pressurized water reactors like Oconee would be vulnerable to that type of degradation. And they bend the plants into highly vulnerable, medium vulnerability, and low vulnerability, and had different inspections based on your vulnerability level. When the inspections were finally done, the NRC had been right in, in determining what factors caused you to be vulnerable or not. Hopefully the NRC is doing a similar process here to figure out who's susceptible and obviously the more susceptible plants will need to do these inspections sooner rather than later. Great. Thanks, Dave. Looks like we have our first question. Uh, this one is from Scott Portsline. Uh, Scott, you should be unmuted now. Uh, oh, yes. Good. Uh, David, are these baffles installed in the reactor at the plant or do they come from the manufacturer installed? Uh, to be honest, Scott, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I should do, <laughs> should have been. I just I have to check on that. I'll get back to you uh, once I track that down. And has uh, Indian Point or anyone else listed a number of possible causations? I, the some plants have had problems in the past um, and have had Gene in the DC Cook plant. Uh, Gene is in upstate New York. DC Cook is in Michigan. They've had some bolt degradation problems. Um, that they, in those cases, they tracked it back to uh, some flaws in the original construction. It's some bad materials dating back to construction. Um, I haven't seen yet uh, any even candidate causes for New Point 2. I think that's not a fault of the company. They need to remove uh, the bolts that have been found to be degraded to do more of a CSI nuclear, if you will, to figure out what the, the causes are. Well, you had to figure it out, but, I mean, it's easy to guess about eight different reasons it could be happening. I, I, I haven't even heard, seen any guesses yet. Um, yeah. I've seen some, as I alluded to, there's been some suggestions that the longer you operate, the more likely you are to have this problem. But that's kind of a uh, easy one. That's I think they need more refinement than, than simply time. Because some of the plants that have been inspected and found very little damage are older than any point unit two. So it's not just operating time. It may be that plus water chemistry, plus material types. Temperature is usually a big factor. The higher the temperature, the more stresses are that can aggravate a problem caused by degradation or corrosion. Yeah, it could even be a chaotic eddy that is occurring similar to uh, steam generator troubles. It's, it's a very possible case. There, there are holes drilled in some of these plates to allow some flow to go through it, so you don't have temp very high temperature differentials across metal. Depending on where you drill those those holes, that could be causing some turbulence that are just making problems worse for some plants. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, so moving on to our next question, we've got a few questions uh, that people have been submitting um, writing. We've got another person in the queue, Marvin Lewis, uh, but we'll go to uh, Ace Hoffman's question. Uh, is there a regulation for how large a loose part is allowed to travel through the system? There's not a regulation on, on loose parts. The, the way the loose parts monitoring systems are, are intended to work is if you did get an indication that you've got something broken loose inside the reactor vessel or, or, or the reactor coolant uh, pressure boundary more broadly, you're then supposed to do an analysis to try to determine whether it's one part, multiple parts, what the source of that might be because whatever broke, it, it, to create the loose parts, it might be a bad thing to have that not fully intact. So that detection indication from the loose parts monitoring system is supposed to trigger that analysis to justify continued operation of the reactor, or if the outcome's not that, to shut down the reactor and do some more inspections to see what's uh, making that noise. 
Great. Uh, so next we'll go to Marvin Lewis uh, to ask his question. Marvin, I'll unmute you now so you can ask. Marvin, are you there? Uh, I think we just heard you a little bit, but um, uh, can you, oh. Marvin? Uh, looks like Marvin is having some trouble with his audio. Uh, we'll try to come back to him in a little bit. Uh, but, in, uh, but we'll next go to a written question from Alfred Meyer. Uh, is there any mechanism for the general public to press the NRC to require inspection of Indian Point 3 immediately, or at least much sooner than 2019? Well, there is a, uh, the mechanism that's available to the public is called the 2.206 process. It's a federal regulation under Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, Section 2.206, that allows any member of the public to petition the NRC to take enforcement action against one of its licensees. The enforcement action that's uh, sought could be a requirement to go out and do an inspection, order the, NRC, the, order the licensee to go out and do the inspection on Indian Point 3. The, demand for inf the petition could also ask for demand for information asking the, company, the owner why it's okay to continue operating in point three until 2019. Uh, 2.206 petitions have been frequently used. Uh, they're, uh, they're, it's not a slam dunk, uh, but it is the process that the, it's available to the public to try to bring about those kind of uh, outcomes. Great. And so we have another uh, audio question from Chaitanya Kalavar. I'll try to unmute Chaitanya now. Um, and I will say just before we get into the next question, uh, we have had some, uh, some people have indicated some problems with the, uh, with the audio for the presentation so far. Uh, not sure if that's something that's happening for a lot of people, uh, but, the, but the webinar is being recorded. So if there are parts of it that you've missed, that will be posted on NIRS's website um, in the next few days. We'll be sending out an email to let everybody know about that. Uh, we haven't had any any interruptions in the audio on this end, so we assume that the recording is is, is being done properly. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Chaitanya, uh, would you like to ask your question? Chaitanya, are you there? You should be unmuted. Uh, well, it sounds like Titania might also be having trouble with the audio, uh, but um, she or he did uh, write their question. Uh, why can the loose parts not be found in a 100% design system? Uh, the loose parts, a lot of the loose parts are found. Uh, the difficulty, uh, well, first of all, how they're found, loose parts are generally metal pieces, uh, and because they're metal, they tend to when the flow is not traveling through the reactor vessel at a high speed, they tend to sink to the bottom. So workers inspect the, the low points, the bottom of the reactor vessel, the low points of pipes, and often find, find loose parts in those areas. When loose parts aren't found, it's generally because the parts are pretty small, about the size of a screw or smaller, and those can wedge themselves into places that uh, are difficult to see. Uh, to supplement visual inspections, it's not uncommon or it's very common to use uh, cameras that are submerged into the water, uh, boroscopes or cameras on the end of fiber optic cables, to try to inspect those uh, areas that are a little bit more challenging. But even there, there, there are places that it's just difficult to get the parts into. It's easier to get the small part into because you've got water jamming it into a corner or a crevice, and it uh, somewhat can be challenging at times to for a camera to follow that path and find it. The problem is, if you don't find that part, as the, as the reactor restarts and heats up metal and metal expands, that metal expansion could free up enough place for the part to fall out and then wander through, be carried by the water again once the reactor is restarted. Yeah, I think, Dave, one of the things that I've, that this has been a real educational experience for me to find out is um, you know, I mean, I assumed, you know, just as a non-expert person, that uh, that the way that the, the 
you know, was structured was a fairly open design. And actually, it's, it seems like it's actually a very complex um, piece of equipment that, um, you know, that, that just would be hard to, to conduct, you know, that kind of comprehensive thorough inspection. Yeah, one of my first jobs in the industry uh, shortly after college was Browns Ferry in Alabama lost some parts. And we, we looked real hard for them because it was much easier to find them to try to convince the NRC it was okay to leave them there. And w these were two-inch square pieces of metal. Uh, we found many, but we couldn't find them all. But, and we looked real hard for real long before we gave up, and, and we just couldn't find them. Okay, so our next is a written question from Michelle Lee. Um, it, uh, she says, at the November 2015 ASLB hearing in New York, State of New York witness Dr. Richard Leahy expressed strong concern over the ability of Indian aging baffle bolts uh, would be able to withstand the kind of shock load events that might occur under accident conditions. Could David expound upon this point and indicate the kinds of events he deems of particular concern? That's a very good point because the degradation of the bolts and the fact that some of the bolt heads apparently have fallen off just during normal wear and tear suggests that they're weak, they're weakened by this degradation. If there were a more challenging event that put more stress on the bolts, then it could be like a zipper effect where bolt after bolt breaks loose, putting more force and more stress on the next bolt, causing it to break. And it's just like a zipper just goes down the line, opening up a whole long series of, of baffle bolts. The kinds of situations that would put the most stress on these plates is a break of a one of the pipes, the outlet pipe. If you break one of the pipes that's connected to the reactor vessel, you get a lot of water jetting out through the broken end of the pipe very fast, kind of like opening up the nozzle on a balloon. That puts a lot of pressure as you have the inlet side that the pipe is still intact, putting water into the vessel and you have one line that's uh, pressure is dropping very, very fastly through that broken pipe. That puts a differential pressure between across these parts, these vertical plates, that could cause weakened bolts or degraded bolts to fail at a much faster rate than they failed during normal wear and tear. As I as I read through Dr. Leahy's testimony, I think that's the, the kind of situation he's concerned about, and that's a, that's a genuine concern that it owns an NRC review every operating cycle because that it takes a bad day into a nightmare. And Dave, maybe to expound on that a little bit, um, you know, one of the one of the, the safety concerns that people have expressed about Indian Point uh, is its vulnerability to, uh, to to earthquakes and seismic effects. And you know, the NRC shortly after Fukushima accident, you know, released uh, you know a, a listing of the reactors that were at greatest danger of poor damage from from a seismic event, and Indian Point uh, topped that list. And so, I mean, is there something to be concerned about, you know, with respect to, to this issue in relation to that? Well, I think the bolts themselves uh, would be subjected to forces during an earthquake. Ground motion would affect them just as it would affect everything else. But I think the larger concern that circles back to the, the question is that if the earthquake, the ground motion, the shaking from, during the earthquake caused one of those pipes connected to the reactor vessel to fail, actually failed something else that fell on the pipe, which in turn caused the pipe to fail, that would cause a larger force on these bolts. Um, so the, the bolts might fail at a higher rate due to the ground motion and earthquake shaking, but it's more likely that they would, more of them would fail if the earthquake caused a pipe to break that put a, a large differential pressure across the bolts and stressed them uh, perhaps beyond the point of breaking. Gotcha. So this is sort of a cascading safety impacts from that kind of an incident? It could be. I mean, the safety studies are done assuming that the pieces, the parts, the components are in pristine condition. And the aging management is supposed to ensure that as degradation occurs, that safety margins aren't compromised to the point where the chance of pipe failures or bolt failures during a postulated accident don't increase. If you've got degradation to the point that bolt heads are falling off during normal wear and tear, then it somewhat undermines the safety net, showing that the plant could survive, you know, more forceful stresses. Um, it, it definitely puts that in question when things are failing during normal operation. Gotcha. Um, so we have another question. Uh, this one from James Bacon. Uh, how long do you think it will take for Entergy to conduct a cause analysis? 
My understanding right now is that Entergy is doing two paths in parallel. One is a pathway to remove the degraded bolts and replace them with uh, good bolts or un undamaged bolts. In parallel with that, they're doing analysis of what the root cause could be for the uh, degraded bolts. The, I'm not sure when, which of those paths will be done first. They both need to be done before the plants can restart. Um, I'm not sure when, in some respects, the, the root cause is going to have to lag at least some of the repairs because that root cause analysis can be speculative right now, but they need to get some of the bolts out to send them off for laboratory analysis to, to either confirm some of the candidate causes or eliminate some if the meteorology doesn't support it. So there's, there's some nexus or overlap between those two parallel paths, um, and it, it will take a time. As far as the replacement of the bolts themselves, I'm hearing that the, the tool that's needed to replace the bolts arrived on site I think last, within the last week, and it's going to take a while. Past plants that have had problems with this have only been able to replace five to eight bolts a day because it's under a lot of feet of water. It's being done remotely, and many of these bolts are in places that are hard to, are marginally accessible, so it just slows things down. And I guess maybe in relation to that, Dave, I mean, you know, uh, how are these bolts attached? Is it possible that there's gradation in how they're actually fastened to the, uh, to, 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 to the component? Well, I, I don't have much information on the, on the level of degradation. Uh, that was one of the questions that came up early on. The company reported 227 degraded bolts. When you look at the procedure that was being used to do these inspections, the threshold for reporting something as degraded is very, very low. So it could be they only have a few that are very extensively degraded, and most of them are, you can detect degradation, but it's not much more than that. So it's, it's difficult, and without that answer or without that context, it's difficult to, to understand whether there's damage in other bolts that's not yet been detected, or if that degradation mechanism could affect the plates that these bolts are fastening together. Um, so I think the, the jury is still out, or not even the jury, I, the, the, the evidence has not yet in, been introduced into the proceeding. Okay. Um, and we have another question from Chaitanya Kalavar. Uh, how sensitive are the bolts to earthquakes? Uh, safety factor is included in their design, if any, for earthquake forces, or is it just pressure gradients? It's a good question. The bolts and, and the internal parts are designed for thermal stresses. As the metal heats up and cools down, the expansion and contraction puts forces on the parts that are in contact with each other. They're also designed for dead weight, gravity. They're designed for the, the forces that they would likely to exceed or be experienced if there was a postulated accident, a pipe break, or, or other problem. Uh, and they're also designed for the design basis earthquake, the forces that they occur. And depending on uh, the situation, some of those forces are combined together. Uh, you don't assume an earthquake occurs at the same time as a design basis accident, uh, so you don't combine those forces. But the earthquake forces, the gravity forces, the thermal expansion are all things that you, you could occur concurrently, so they are combined or considered at the same time. Um, and the next question is from Robert Whitney. In simplest terms, how would, how would failures as those described impact the immediate environment and nearby resident populations? Well, the plant is designed for a loss of coolant accident, which these bolts uh, could affect. The assuming other safety features at the plant, namely the containment barrier, um, remains f fully functional, that would minimize the amount of uh, radioactivity that it gets released from a damaged core, <coughs> excuse me, should a damaged core occur. So it, the, ba the baffle bolts and the problems could make a, an accident worse, but they themselves won't compromise the barrier, the containment barrier. So as long as that independent barrier remains intact and does this thing as it can, then it, it's not likely to cause a huge problem to the community, either the public or the or contaminate the environment. If that containment barrier is not doing its thing, then things could get worse. 
Um, and, uh, and then a question from Bruce Rosen. Indian Point sits on a tidal estuary. Ostensibly during, during Hurricane Sandy, the Hudson came, between, uh, came within one feet of overflowing the containment pond. Uh, how does this siting complicate the metallurgical deterioration? I'm not sure if that question is answerable. But. Well, I think that the, the answer that I was going towards was uh, one of the lessons learned, one of the many lessons learned from Fukushima is that external forces can cause problems at plants. So one of the things the NRC is doing is requiring all owners to reevaluate their vulnerabilities or their protections built into the plants to, to handle severe earthquakes and severe flooding events. Uh, that's an ongoing process. There's still some homework to be done there. But I think the potential impacts of uh, extreme flooding or severe flooding events at any point will be addressed during that, that current work in progress. Um, I hope that doesn't tap dance around that answer, but I think that's the process that will best resolve that concern. Sure. Um, and a question from Susan Carpenter. In general, how well does acoustic monitoring do in detecting parts? Acoustic monitor. I've not yet heard of many success stories with acoustic monitoring. There have been a lot of loose parts that were detected by broken things, things that the loose parts damaged, and not so many found by the acoustic monitors. So I think whoever the vendor that sold the acoustic monitors had a better marketing department than engineering department, um, was able to sell a lot of things that don't seem to have a lot of value behind them. Um, but We'll see. One of the questions we've asked the NFC is what did the metal impact monitoring system at any point to detect, if anything? We haven't got that answer yet. <coughs> Great. Well, that seems to be all the questions that we have. Uh, Dave, I really want to thank you for taking the time to, to do this presentation and to answer the questions. Um, is there anything that you would, well, we have another one coming up, but, um, but you know, um, after we're done with the questions, I'll ask you to, um, is there anything that you'd like to wrap up with or any concluding comments that you'd like to make? Well, um, the, the last comment, the last question that we have is um, from Colleen Bonnewell. Uh, we were told it is, so where is the leak reminder? Uh, earthquakes occur every 200 years on the east. I'm not sure if maybe this is also in relation to the um, to the uh, the leaks that have been occurring in the Indian Point fuel pool. Well, the, yeah, the Indian Point fuel pool. Um, that, that's a <laughs> salt in the wounds. Since 1993, the, the stainless steel liner that fill, surrounds the Indian Point uh, refueling cavity has been leaking. The only reason it was installed is to prevent leakage following a, an earthquake. Um, but it's been leaking ever since 1993. During this current outage, workers went in again and tried to fix it and were unsuccessful. Um, since that's the only purpose is to prevent leakage following an earthquake, the fact that it's leaking before the earthquake should be a problem, but both the NRC and the owner are aware of the problem but have not yet been successful in repairing that safety problem. Um, Sometimes a little concerned that the NRC's approach to safety is wait till something bad happens and then take a step back. Uh, I wish they'd be a little bit more aggressive in, in protecting the public and workers. Great. Um, and we have another question um, from Chaitanya Kalavar. I'm going to un unmute Chaitanya so that she or he can ask the question. Chaitanya, are you with us? Okay, we appear to be having another audio problem. Do want to apologize to everybody online um, for the apparent problems that have been occurring uh, with the audio on the webinar. Uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of that before our next presentation. Uh, but like I said, we you know we have had um, you know uh, the audio on our end the entire time, so we assume that the that the recording has been going through okay, and we'll be able to make that available to everyone within a couple of days. Um, so with that, I think, you know, Dave, I'll hand it to you for, for, for some concluding remarks. I think one of the things that concerns us about this situation in Union Point Unit 2 and perhaps uh, more broadly across the industry is that, that there are two trends that uh, work against each other and could compromise safety. One is the fact that these plants are getting older, they're aging, parts are wearing out as these uh, degraded bolts at Union Point Unit 2 demonstrate. 
At the same time, the industry is under a lot of pressure to reduce costs. At the NRC's annual conference last month, the industry said they need to reduce, the average nuclear plant needs to reduce its cost by about 25% in order to compete uh, with non-nuclear neighbors. At a time when plants are wearing out and, and it's necessary to replace parts to maintain safety margins, a pressure to reduce costs is a challenge. It doesn't mean the owners will fail to meet that challenge, but it means the owners must be very, very careful in what they decide, how they uh, decide to apply limited resources. It's important that they defer the right things and don't defer things that uh, could cause problems. As, as those two trends continue to work in opposite directions, those decisions become more and more important, and we turn to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to make sure wrong decisions aren't made that could ultimately come back someday to cause a huge problem. Sure. Well, and, and Dave, I think maybe in relation to that, we actually just got another question that touches on maybe the broader implications of the issue you just raised. Uh, this is from Bruce Rosen. Uh, does anyone in the House or Senate on an appropriate committee understand these problems? I've not heard any questions um, from the House or Senate. They're, the questions that the NRC is getting is, uh, can't they get off the backs of the poor plant owners, um, stop asking a lot of questions, uh, minimize their staff, cut back on inspections? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the right focus for the situation we have today. But it won't be the only issue Congress seems to be struggling with uh, at the moment. Gotcha. Well, that's a set to spring <clears throat> assessment. Um, and but uh, with that, I think you know we'll have any more questions. We could go ahead and wrap up. Um, and want to thank you again, Dave, for you know for doing this presentation. And thanks to thanks to everybody else for uh, for for joining and participating and for your um, for your terrific questions today. Uh, we will be continuing for this at NEARS. Um, we'll be getting out information as you know as needed. You know, to the extent that there are developments as this situation evolves, um, you know, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll entertain the, the possibility of, of doing another presentation like this in the future. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we'll end the webinar. And, uh, and please look for an email from us within a few days uh, notifying you that the, that the recording has been posted on our website. Um, so thank you, everyone, and, uh, and hope, to, uh, hope, to, hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone.